Harlan Williams here. Harlan, what is your favorite word? Um, my favorite word is conundrum. Love yeah. that word. Yeah. As soon as I discovered what that word was, I it's one of those words I actively try to use a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For to describe any sort of like predicament. Yeah. Or uh, tough call. Yeah, it's a conundrum. Be a great name for a uh, child. Yeah. Conundrum. Dinner's ready. Fuck off. Hey, it's Herbert. Mm-hmm. And you're listening to the About Last Night podcast, you slippery little son of a bitch. Cans on. Remember when cans was a term for breasts? You can turn me up in the uh, headphones a little bit. Too. Yes, I can. Thanks, bud. Cans. It's also a term for for jail. Singular. Oh yeah, you're you in get, the can. You're in the can. Get tossed in the can. Toilet as well. Yeah, the can, the toilet. What was your favorite uh, term for? You know, like I had a boss, Dan Boyle, when I worked at Albertsons bagging groceries. Yeah. And he'd go every week. It seemed like he had a new way to describe. Bosoms, which was another one. Right. Um, he'd say uh, ba- Bajumbas, oh, which I God. thought was like some sort of Mario villain. Right. Um, cans, which I'd heard before, I think, in the movies. I feel like I'd heard Tom Selleck say it to like Kim Basinger. Yeah. Um, and then, um, uh, what did I say? Jum- Jumbalas? Things like Jumbaloo. He had like a weird. They sounded oh. like Jungle Book characters almost. Yeah, sure. I think, and then I think uh, that was one. I think it was a, a, a puma. <laughs> yeah. And then at one point he just was like, "Look at those big fat titties." And I was like, "Yikes!" Yeah, I was Very like, "Hey, direct. Dan. Dan, I'm 15. Yeah, you know, I haven't even seen these live yet. So if you can kind of." Yeah, just the way he was so descriptive about them and and passionate, it could get a young boy your age. Excited. In trouble, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it could get, get you excited. And, and, and in uh, trouble for being too excited. Yeah, and, and that was probably, what, back in the early, <laughs> s- late 70s for you. He was 70. I was 15, that which made it even weirder. even more trouble, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Good to see you, Har. You too. What a treat. This is a great uh, great day. What's on your hat there? Uh, it's probably the, is it the Punisher? Looks like is it. Is it the skull? It looks like it. Yeah, that's the Punisher. Oh, it's yeah. a, a Marvel character. Let's just get into it. Okay. The last movie I saw with Harlan Williams was Marvel Endgame. Oh, it was? Yeah. Oh, wow. I know. You see you see a lot of movies. Marvel Endgame. And remember, they cried. Everyone cried. Oh, yeah. The first 35, 40 minutes of the movie, yeah. we're looking at each other like, do we walk? We yeah. walked out of Johnny English. Yeah. We walked out of another one I can't remember. Which that's on you, movie, for not yeah. being memorable, even yeah. for the walkout. But they every two minutes, Hulk would Hulk was working at an AT and T that threw us off. Remember Hulk, that? he had a turtleneck sweater and designer <laughs> eyewear, like pre- designer prescription glasses. Yeah, it was the it was the worst. It was tough they, to get they, through. They destroyed what superheroes and supervillains are. Yeah, it, it I just horrible. want action. I want hot action. Yeah, right out of the gate. Yeah, can I, can something happen in a movie that makes you go like, oh, this, like you have a a few minutes to really right the wrong here. Like, is do you remember ever seeing a movie? Because you now I feel like, you know, have such a, uh, you know, distinguished palette for films, right? You feel like yeah. you can know if you're gonna like it or hate it early on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the best surprises is when you think you're gonna hate it and you're starting to hate it, and then it goes around a corner and you're like, oh wait, I'm starting to like this, yeah. but. But the problem with superhero movies is now it's like every plot line has to be some maniacal villain that's trying to not just like, you know, blow up a building yeah. or, you know, knock out the subway. Yes. But he's trying to destroy not even the planet now, but the galaxy. <laughs> like they're trying to annihilate everything that ever 
yes. existed, every molecule. And so <laughs> each movie, the, the stakes just get higher and higher to the point where they're going to be destroying realities that we don't even know exist. <laughs> yes, it, it's just, just to come up with plot lines. Yeah, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And these, these heroes, and I don't mind the guys like Iron Man and the Hulk yeah. who are kind of got these exoskeletons and they're strong, but then you, you throw in the archer who's got, you know, Robin oh. Hood's <laughs> bow and arrow. And then you got the black widow who all she knows is some karate moves yeah. and she rides a motorcycle. She doesn't even have venom like a black widow. <laughs> she just, she rolls and kicks. That's an easy move. If she's yeah. venom, have her, have her maybe a bite. Yeah, or something. She shoots venom? Something, yeah, but she's just a girl in, in uh, you know, Lululemon workout clothes. That has a yellow belt in Taekwondo. Yeah, and she's rolling around and kicking monsters 78 <laughs> feet high made out of, you know, metals from distant galaxies that a nuclear weapon can't penetrate, and somehow she can roundhouse them in the throat and take them down <laughs> with, her, with her Calvin Klein boots. <laughs> It's just, it's, uh, you can't even watch these movies now, anymore. You're already being asked to suspend your disbelief. But yeah. But, like, come on, man. Meet me halfway. Yeah. It's almost like when Extra used to do this thing called rumor control, where they would basically, like, you just talk about heightening the world so big to where it's, like, not even believable just to yeah. have something for people to follow. It's like we've ran out of narratives that are, like, so we're just creating these bigger storylines that are so impossible that it's like, I can't even get on board with that. Yeah. Extra used to do this with rumor control where they'd, you could tell they were, thirsty for stories and headlines so they'd be like extra extra rumor control was tom hanks seen at a chuck e cheese doing lines of tylenol pm off Lindsay lohan's butt crack whoa and then they go <laughs> by the way your reaction was everybody at home watching when yeah. they heard that yeah oh no oh god hanks is in a tizzy oh so golly. then they'd, they'd spread this rumor out and then they go our extra rumor control got to the bottom of it and no he was not what and you're like waste. obviously but they just needed some filler, something to kind of get the uh, the gossip train moving. So well, they'd make a bullshit and then go, don't worry, we got to the bottom of yeah, it and crack nothing. the case. Yeah. And well, what's worse about these movies is that, that, that they're making the uh, the plot lines so huge. Like mm -hmm. I said, they're, they're making them so uh, almost God himself couldn't stop yes. the destruction coming. Yes. But what they've also done, they've also gone the wrong way with the superheroes where they've made them like you're watching an afternoon soap opera where they're crying, they're talking about their inner feelings, yeah. they're, they, they don't want to fight, they're coddling their children. They're Thinking about retiring. Yeah, it's like, it's like what the hell? They've got everything's ass backwards. It's, it's horrible. I'm surprised they haven't made a Captain Planet movie yet. Like a true, like Captain, like remember the Planeteers? No, I don't remember the planet. It was like here. earth, wind, fire, water. That's a band, bro. That's <laughs> a band. It was a cartoon. No, that's a that's a soul band. <laughs> and uh I think uh what's next? Barry White is the next <laughs> Superman? What where are you going, guy? Watch your mouth. Watch I've been trying to petition you. for that for years. Are you serial? Yeah. <laughs> God. Harlan, you uh you have so many you have so many skills in your in your arsenal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> One in I, my quiver. That's what in the, your quiver. The, the, the bow and arrow thing's called a quiver. Nice. That's who was the actor? Jeremy Renner. Yeah. He yeah. was like, "Don't worry, I'll take out this yeah. nine hundred pound beast." Yeah. <laughs> a titanium robot from planet whatever. I got I, it. I got a stick with a sharp thing on the tip of it. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Um, there are these videos I was perusing through your uh, your Instagram a little bit ago. I forgot how, like, the sketch world is something, I guess, because maybe I haven't seen you in, like, a full-on sketch show, and right. I know you as comic, actor, show creator, voiceover, you know, but, like, you had this sketch on your IG. I'm just going to play part of it into my phone. Do you oh, mind? okay. Sure. It was one of the funniest things I've seen in a long time, and it made me... I've really gotten into Tim Robinson's sketch show on Netflix. I think you should leave. I don't know if you've ever watched any of it or heard oh, of it. Oh, I've seen one I episode. Think you yeah, really it's very dig it. quirky. Yeah. yeah, but uh, you have this fucking character. Oh man, is Instagram down? Uh, I haven't no. been able to log on to it in the last oh. uh, wow three hours. That's no, fun. I'm on. Sad. You want to use mine? Do you mind? No. Um, was that ever something in your just comedic journey where you were like, "Thanks, doggy." Where you were like, I, uh, 
was it like sketch stand up? Obviously, growing up around a lot of you know uh, prestigious sketch people, right? I'm sure yeah. you're an SCTV fan, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I loved it. Did that? Was that ever like a, a path that you were like, oh, I want that to be what I do when I get to LA? Yeah, it was definitely in my wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah it was something, uh, and I auditioned for a few sketch shows, and at one point I auditioned for SNL oh, and shit. things like that, and um, and I even wrote and produced uh, a couple of uh, pilots, uh, sketch show pilots that got made. And, wow! And that I think the character you're looking at is from one of the pilots. Okay, I think good. you're. Uh, I think you know. I think I know where you're going with Ernie Childs. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is... Hi, Ernie Childs here with our amazing new product for your car, the brand new crotch feeder. Here we go. We all know how hard it is to eat and drive at the same time. Look out. Here we go. Oh, boy. Taking your hand off the wheel is a dangerous thing. Oh, boy. Here we go. Well, now there's a new safer way to eat when you're on the run. Look out. Here we go. The crotch feeder fits through any fly, flap, or front door of it's your It's a prosthetic hand. Or knickers. Look out. Just strap it in, get in your car, and leave the feeding to us. The hand Delicious. is feeding him a burger. And my hands never leave the wheel. Oh, boy. Here we go. And if you order now, we'll throw in our magic nose-picking finger. Here we go. The noise. Look out. That's a $15 value. <laughs> a fabulous new crotch feeder. Order yours today, and we'll throw in our patented flip-off <laughs> finger for free. Oh, dude. Yeah, he's a fun you character. Know, yeah. Oh, my God. The, the wig, the voice is, like, just enough inflected from your regular speaking voice. So funny, dude. Thanks. And thanks. that quirky type of, like... Running back the, oh, boy. Oh, here, boy. Look here we, out. Here we, go. here we go. Man, so yeah, funny. Yeah, I'm actually getting ready to shoot some new ones of him because oh, people really like him. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. So you yeah. found these and then just put them up as, like, throwbacks and then. I had, you know, I, I shot three sketch show pilots, like, from top to bottom. Oh, wow. Like, like fully produced. Like, they're actually quite good. I'm sure. And for some reason or other, they never got picked up or right. bought. There's a lot of things that never make it to air that are really done well. Yeah. And and I was going through some of my, my old footage, and I was like, gosh, these, these are really fun, and why don't I just put them up? Now we live in this world where we can throw them up on Instagram. Yeah. And, give uh, them new life. Yeah, you know, give them not even new life, like life period. Yeah. And, and so uh, things that probably never would have got seen – you know ever uh now get a shot and so these little sketches are perfect and uh so i've been putting them up and they've actually inspired me to shoot some new ones awesome. because they're they were i remembered how fun they were oh dude please if there's a, if there's like a jewish deli owner with a heart oh of you gold, want to be in one i'll be in all of them oh great Come okay on, the next one i bought it it's so funny i actually went on you can buy anything on amazon oh yeah and I bought this. What I needed was it looked like a giant squirt, you know, like a, like someone splatted or threw like a hot chocolate at a wall. Yeah. And so the next one is it's going to be, hi, Ernie Childs here with the amazing new shit stain. <laughs> Tired of having bare empty walls with no artwork? Pfft, how about a shit stain? <laughs> Tired of birds <laughs> flying into your windows? Put up a shit stain. They'll never crash into the glass ever. So just, oh, just stuff we like got to get toy birds and somehow manipulating <laughs> yeah. them about to fly in and then seeing it and then yeah. stopping and turning around. Yeah, no, that's so. I'm just I'm, dude. That's so fucking yeah, funny. Fun. Is this guy inspired from? You know how they always say like people, certain characters they pull from at least like Dana Carvey's Garth is you know his brother Brad mm, more or less. No, it was kind of a mishmash of like all these um, guys I saw growing up as a kid. You know the cheesy used car salesman yeah. and the late night commercials and the 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 character actually Ernie Childs came from. When the bare naked ladies were at the peak of their fame, yep. they did like a as a joke for their next album. They did like a like a half hour mockumentary, and they asked me to come and play like the host of the thing. And I just didn't want to do me, so I created Ernie Childs, and I did that whole thing with the band. And it was so fun when I did a sketch show. I brought them back. And, That's uh, amazing. Yeah. So the wig is just classic and yeah, it's so, so cheesy i feel like the voice the wig i mean you tell me but like if any sketch stuff i've done or character work obviously like the 
I know there's some people, you know, who talk about like the way the person walks is the first thing they need to figure out. But for a, a goof like that, I feel like as soon as you look at yourself in the mirror with that different set of facial hair or or hair on top, yeah, that kind of can kind of fuel and dictate what yeah. you're going to sound like vocally, right? Yeah, and physically. I mean, this guy, when you watch him walk, he has a real sense of purpose. He comes out sort of aggressively and hits his mark, and he's kind of real matter of fact. So, yeah, that's the beauty of acting. I mean, I've done a, a number of movies where I had to, you know, dress up and drag and be a woman yes and the beauty of it is i tell you when you know you're sitting there going how do i find this character and and as soon as you are in full regalia like in pantyhose and a dress mm -hmm. and a bra and when they start putting the makeup and the wig on the character for me at least just finds me because you know have you ever gone to a wedding and you put on a tuxedo yeah. and you've got the cummerbund and all of a sudden, you sort of feel like a different guy. You feel like James Bond yeah. almost. Like you, you, you become very that first like twenty minutes you're wearing it. You feel like a supermodel, even if we're not good looking or whatever. You, you feel like a million bucks. Like yeah. it changes your kind of energy and who you are and how you carry yourself. And and when you dress up like in full drag with with everything, you just the, the, for me the characters just find me. I mean that happens with most of my movies. Yeah. I people always say, how do you prepare and and I usually let the characters find me, to be honest. Once wow. I, yeah, I, I love it. It's such a surprise because I, I don't really know what they're going to be like a lot of the time. So it's really fun. Is there somebody you'd like to, you see all these biopics getting made, like, you know, Will Smith is getting ready to do another one where he plays Venus and Serena Williams' dad. Right. Uh, is there somebody, a figure that you've always just looked up to or been like, man, if I got the chance, like, I feel like I could knock that out of the park uh, and flex my chops, you know? you know i i wish i was good looking enough to say jim morrison because i loved i loved the doors and, and You're perfect val, You're right Kil there. val kilner knocked it over the wall and i'm you know i think you got to start by having a chin you know which i don't have <laughs> but uh it's funny talking about jim and we're literally in the shadow of the chateau marmont where he used to yeah. climb out on the on the roof and on the window ledges but anyways i would have loved to have been uh jim morrison mm. I, I i can't but i auditioned once for the three stooges movie and it's the only movie i ever they asked us to come in in character and i actually sent away i had to i went in as larry you know the the the, the guy with the spongy hair yeah. and how you doing that guy you know it's like i kind of really worked on his voice and and i sort of look like him a bit sure. and I, I got i rented an old suit like a period piece suit awesome. and i got the hat and the hair and the punisher hat uh, not the punisher oh, hat but but i went in and i really nailed it i could tell i really did. surprised the uh the producers was I, it fairly right the, it was the fairly yeah. brothers i didn't i didn't get the part but i i could tell that that it was one of the th I, I knew i really kind of did a good job with it but um but yeah, I don't know who else I would I would want to play. Um, I'll, let me think about it and I'll circle back. Okay. Maybe uh, Meryl Streep. Uh, Meryl Streep, maybe. maybe. <laughs> I told you I do like dressing up like a woman. Yeah. So. What was the part about in Sorority Boys? Like that's what you're referring to, right? But you've done it. I did two movies. I did Sorority Boys, where I was uh, I had to dress up like a girl, and then I did another movie that. It's hard to find because it was, Disney used to do these movies called Movie of the Week. Yeah. And they'd play them every Sunday night on ABC. They're like family time movies. And I did a movie called Mr. Head Mistress where I'm a guy that's kind of running from some bad guys in a hideout in an all-girls boarding school awesome. dressed as a British woman. And they think I'm the new headmistress. And so it was kind of <laughs> like some very kind of my Mrs. Doubtfire type of movie. I was going to say, yeah. And no one really saw it because it only aired like two times on, on the movie of the week, and then it was gone. But it was just, it was one of my favorite movies to do, believe it or not. Holy it was shit. really, uh, it was a great acting challenge. Yeah. It was a great character. It was, it was really, I had an amazing time with it. Do you remember the voice you would do? Oh, hello there. Every, hello, girls. Would you please, oh, look at you. Go and brush your teeth and pluck those hairs out of your nose. Yeah. Like kind of a Margaret Thatcher meets oh, yeah. Mickey Mouse sort of yeah. type of thing, but 
it was great. And, you know, I was surrounded by all these school kids. And then we had people playing the, the administration. And yeah. We actually, they actually found a, an old boarding school that had been closed down. But it to was, film it at. Yeah, and this thing was probably over 100 years old. And it was, it was really, like, it's just such a great setting. So everything felt really authentic and real. And That's what I was going to be my question. Like, what about the getting into the full women garb? Did you, like... What like did you like did you put a tampon in and go this feels right? <laughs> I tried, <laughs> I, I did try. I broke the drill head off though, and I was I have very hard skin. Um, but uh, <laughs> I don't know, like lipstick or like a the oh I, everything. I mean, when we did sorority boards, they waxed our bodies. They they took all the hair off our bodies. When I did the Mister Head Mistress. Full makeup, wig, eyeshadow, blood. Like, it made me appreciate women. Like, I didn't realize the, the steps that women go through when they, when they get decked out every day. Yeah. Like, not just the clothing, but the, the, the war paint on the face, the hair, yeah. the eyelashes, the, the eyebrows. Thing. Oh, my God. Yeah, dude. We have and it so easy. We just, we just get up and go eat cow chocula. That's like crazy. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, it, it's insane. Well, you got longer hair now. Is that uh, a little bit, um, have you upped the maintenance? No, I just put it in a pony. I just put a band around it and I love it, tie dude. it off. Have yeah. you ever had a little bun like that in the back before? I, oh, yeah. When I was first coming up in stand-up, I had, like, hair down to here. I had Holy really shit. long hair. Yeah, yeah. And then when I moved to Hollywood, I made a concerted effort to cut it. I thought, you know, if I'm going to go if I'm gonna go to Hollywood and I'm going to get cast in movies and TV, I should probably look a little more... Um, Castable? Yeah, because I thought with, with the long hair, I'd only have a shot at... Jim Morrison and that's it. Yeah, I blew it. You're right. I could have been Morrison. Damn it. Kilner, you ass. Dirty. Did you guys ever audition? Did you remember? Who were those people that you remember like being in the audition rooms with that were like going in for same parts as you? You know what I'm saying? Oh. I remember going in for back to sketch shows for a minute. I, I went in for a sketch show years back. And this was the moment I kind of realized how cruel Hollywood is and how unjust. I, I went in for a sketch show. And I'm looking around the room, and uh, Craig, uh, who's the guy from The Office? Craig Robinson. Craig Robinson was there. I didn't really, this was pre The Office. Yeah. I didn't know. But just looking at him, I could tell he had like a kind of a humorous spirit. Sure. And then, and then I'm looking around the room, and uh, Kevin McDonald from Kids in the Hall. Whoa. Who, who at that time, they had just finished redefining <clears throat> the sketch comedy world. Yes. I mean, there was, there was, Second City, Saturday Night Live, and then Kids in the Hall came along. And I looked around that room and I go, how dare you? Like, th this is this is like a, a sketch comedy guru. He just rewrote the book and you're making this guy audition? And I felt, A, I, I knew him. I, I said hi to him and I, I felt sad for him. I felt, I felt pissed off that they would make a guy like him jump through the hoops yeah. and not just say, hey, what, you want to do this? Let's go. Yeah. And that's when I kind of went, wow, Hollywood, like, they don't care how, how you climb or mm -hmm. who you are. Like, it's just, it's a tough, cruel place, man. They want you to go through the process and kind of oh. like what, it's almost like a, you know, a power trip in a way of just like, things can't be as easy as like, yeah, you're it, great. You did this. We get it. Yeah, we like, know what you do. And, and that like, was then let's, that was, hey, kids in the hall was cool, man. But let's, yeah. uh, this is. It's, I don't this know. It's Wiggles fuck house. I whatever. think the last one I did was like a, I don't know, probably was about six, seven years ago, maybe now. Mm. And I think it's when I kind of stopped wanting to audition because it kind of broke my heart. I went into another, like a sitcom or something. I don't even, you know, one of these, when the network still had all the sitcoms and I'm sitting there and I'm going in to read and Kramer from Seinfeld walks in. Yeah. And I was so, it was such an affront to my sensibilities. I was so, and I was enraged. And here he is, he's, he sits down and he looks so uncomfortable. And and you know in his head he's probably going, what am I doing here? A thousand percent. And I was so freaking mad that I, I, I just, I, I almost walked out. Like I just, I, I, I even said to the, the, the receptionist, I said, that's your guy. You want funny? You want proven funny like he's right there how you much idiots. more tape do you need 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, like I was just, you know, the guy did 12 seasons of the top show on television. <laughs> yeah. He's in television history. Yeah. And he's sitting here reading for a small part on Three Guys and a Baby or whatever that stupid <laughs> show is. What's that stupid Two, 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 two young men or whatever. Yeah, what's two, it called? Oh, two and a half men. Two and a half men or something. Yeah, it was just like I was like, are you freaking kidding me, man? I was, I was pissed. I kind of, it kind of dropped my heart a little bit, and I yeah. kind of, I sort of stopped going out for auditions after that. I was wow. just like, it just, it just really bothered Took me. Took the fun out of it, huh? It just, it just made me realize just, it's just, I don't know, it's just all kinds of things. It's like a bomb went off in my head. Like sure. first it was Kevin McDonald, and then it was this guy, yeah. and then. It just, I don't know, just cruel, those, cruel. Those epiphanies, I mean, they, they happen when they happen. And I yeah. think it's like you either, you know, suppress it and go, uh, it's, this is part of it, or you, you know, acknowledge it and allow it to be maybe a, a, you know, a change in the way you're looking at things that's, you know, for the better, for the worse is TBD, I guess. But Yeah, I get it, too. I get it. It's the way things are, too. But still, it's just like, come on, you know, I don't know. You know what I really love is just speaking of Hollywood, you and Orny, and you know I, I have had some running hikes, and I think there's a different path we need to now take because I've been seeing these videos that you and Orny <laughs> yeah. stopped the Hollywood Star Tours. Yeah, right. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, A, always, I think I've been with you once maybe where you did stop and scream something out, and I, I'm, I can't remember when because it definitely triggered a memory, but I love to do that where it's just like, I, I can't be by yourself because you need an audience. You need somebody to like – either call you out or you call them out. Right. And Orny uh, was, I think a couple different times, was like, oh, no, you did it to, You did it for Orny, saying there's Christian Slater. Yeah. And here's the great thing about these Hollywood star tour vans. People are so removed from this business yeah. that they truly, you Orny looks nothing like Christian oh, Slater. Oh, yeah. May, I mean, maybe if you squint and he's wearing, like, glasses and a hat and a yeah, fucking moo moo. English and, moors during a heavy fog. Yeah, yeah. you're on ecstasy, yeah. you know? Like, maybe then yeah. you're like, I think I recognize that guy oh, yeah. from The Wizard. And yeah. uh, and so, so and then he goes, hey, that's Leonardo DiCaprio to you. Yeah. And this is what's great is you go, hey, folks. <laughs> Just sounding <laughs> yeah, like Harlan Williams. Try, yeah. You don't even try. And you go, hey, folks. You go, <laughs> you go <laughs> what is this? Fuck, what did you scream? Uh, well, you made Orny as Christian Slater go. You go, do your famous line, Christian. Yeah. You can't handle the truth. Yeah. And some guy does it back. And then and then the woman driving the bus is like, we've got a lot of people on this that love movies, and this is such a big deal. And, yeah. and then you're just like, Leo, do what? I mean, dude, it was just so funny. And people are looking at you guys truly like... I don't know if they don't know that you're like. Yeah, they're tr well. I think it's like you know when you buy something, you want it to really work really good, or yes. you or you you know if you go whale watching, you want to see a whale. Gotcha. Or if you go to looking for Bigfoot, you want it. So, so they're so desperate to <laughs> have a memory, to see someone <laughs> yeah. that they're probably willing to just disbelieve <laughs> a little bit that hey, could that? Because we usually have sunglasses and yes. baseball hats yeah. on, so. I think there's there's elements of where they they want to believe it or it, it's like these people that buy you know forty million dollar Picassos mm. and then find out that they're frauds, but they don't take them down because a if they do they're gonna look like an idiot to their friends and then when their friends come over they can't say hey we've got an original Picasso on the wall so what they do is they perpetrate the the the, the charade and they leave the the fraud paintings up. They almost want the people who told them it's a fraud to go away because it kind of burst their bubble. Yeah. And so I think these people on these star tours are like, hey, we paid 60 bucks to see Tom Hanks cutting his grass. Well, if we can't have him, there's Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> yelling at us like an idiot on the side of my all. Yelling at Orny Adams' Christian Slater impression. Yeah. yeah. That's so funny. It's dude. fun. And we, have, we have a blast. You know the I, the the, the real humiliation. You said you can't do it alone. Yeah, I actually did it alone once. I, this was this was years before. This was when I was a little more on the hot sheet when I was doing a lot of movies yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Oh and, yeah. And you know when you live in Hollywood, you drive past these star vans all the time. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, I used to have a convertible, and I thought, you know what? I just I gotta see what happens. You know so. I was in the convertible and I pulled up beside a, at a red light beside a packed, a packed um, star Hollywood yeah. star tour van, and I thought I'm going to see what happens. So I, I look over and I just I honk the horn. I go, "Hey, 
you guys seen any celebrities yet? You know, thinking yeah, great. someone would go, hey, yeah, that's the guy. Yeah. And they'd, someone just looked at me and go, no. And then they drove away. <laughs> <laughs> I was just so, I was so oh, mortified. Dagger. Yeah. Yeah. Did you fall him to the next stoplight? Are you guys <laughs> yeah, sure? Are you guys sure? There's, yeah. there's plenty around yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You haven't seen Rocket Man around, have you? <laughs> but I'll never forget on that same uh, note, I was telling Orny this the other day. You know, I used to tour with Jim Carrey back when he was still doing stand up. Yeah. And he was he was a star in his own right from In Living Color and everything. He still hadn't done all the big movies yet, but we were in Atlanta once in a in a limo and we were driving along and we came to a stoplight and there was cars on every side and there's an suv beside us with a family in it there's a whole bunch of kids and the parents and and jim just says i gotta do this and he he hit the power window and the window went down and it was summertime so they had their windows open and he, he just looked at them and he goes hi i'm jim carrey <laughs> And they all looked over and they freaked the hell out. <laughs> and then he just did the window right up and we drove away. And I was like, oh it was my so great. God. Yeah, it was so funny to see him do that. That's such like, yeah, dude. That's an amazing thing to be there for yeah. live in the flesh. And also like a cool, I don't know, like you're. it's a great example of you just not taking yourself too seriously. Yeah. And you're, yeah. you're also though very aware of like, I can do this fun thing that's fun for us that's so simple and truly like those people probably still talk about that. Yeah, it was it was a thrill for them. I mean, you know, even as actors, you know, living in Hollywood, if Jack Nicholson did that to me out here on Sunset Boulevard, oh, I'd, yeah. I'd flip out. Oh, you yeah. know, I remember driving actually here on Sunset. I think it was the night of the Oscars one year. Mm. And I was just <laughs> like at the light over here, like where the McDonald's is. Yeah. And the light turned red and I pulled up and I looked to my right. And in a tuxedo, driving beside me was Steve Martin, and I just, I was just, just to see him, I was like, he didn't see me, but I, I, I saw him, I was like right there, and I was like, holy smoke, like it blew my mind. I was super excited, you know. Is that like the uh, person that you met that you never thought you'd see? You know, you all have that like once you get out here, I guess you get it becomes a little more attainable the more you yeah. get into stuff. You're like, oh, there's a chance I could run run into this yeah. person maybe at the comedy store or or um, at a you know a, a shoot if I get you know whatever. But um, was there somebody when you first got out here? You're like, wow, if I see that person, I know I'll have made it, or uh, that'll kind of you know insinuate that I'm truly in Hollywood. Or was Steve Martin that guy for you? I guess no. I th I think it was just all of them because yeah. there's so many big stars, and I thought, should I get the chance to work with any of them, or act with them, or yeah. be around them? And then, God, when I go through the checklist of the people I've worked with, it almost blows my mind. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, I did a movie with De Niro and Hoffman and Richard Dreyfus and Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels and Bruce Willis and James Caan and I mean it just goes on what and on and I'm like it? how did I this kid from the suburbs of Toronto how am I acting with these right these people it's just a, a mind blower I still kind of pinch myself it was such a such a treat like unbelievable what was the Dreyfus movie I did a movie called uh, you were my, one of the kids my, in Mr. Holland's Opus were you I was I was the one that got say it Let's just say my opus hurt the next day, all right? <laughs> um, no, I. Uh, it was. Uh, it was uh, too soon. <laughs> I always thought that movie was like it just. I always thought it was Mr. Holland's <laughs> anus, right? It's like opus anus. Opus it's, anus. It's wasn't right opus there. and anus a comedy duo <laughs> in the in the fifties? Yeah, it was uh, Laurel and Hardy, and opus, opus and, and anus, anus, and <laughs> and Opie and Anthony. Laurel. And, <laughs> Uh, but yeah. I did uh, a movie called My Life in Ruins with okay. uh, with um, Richard. Wow. Yeah, amazing. Richie Richie D. Did you call him? I didn't know. I just right. no no. It was uh, he's one of the greats. I mean, there's guys like that yeah. that you put in a category of you know unsung heroes that you're like, dude, you just have been in some iconic films, but yeah. you're just so good, so good. Well, what's in incredible to me, and I'm not knocking the other actors, but we had quite the ensemble cast. Gotcha. You know, the, the movie was about a, a bunch of characters on a tour bus going through Greece. And so we all had to be there every day on that bus because when you do a bus or a submarine, I also did a submarine movie, you, you, always, have, yeah. Yeah, you always have people in the background. So yes. you, everyone always had to be there. And, um, and I, I'll never forget it. Every time Richard had a scene 
like whether you had a solo scene or whatever, I would be right over the director's shoulder watching them and everyone else would be gone back to their trailers. And I was like, how are you not watching this guy? How are you not learning for like, I would study everything. He was good for you. Every little inflection, just the way you, you could see it, you know, like, whereas, uh, you know, a lot of people in a movie would just like maybe raise an eyebrow or have a little twitch or whatever. You, you could see that everything the guy did was just so had a purpose and, and it felt like it, I don't know. He was amazing to watch. So yeah, everything felt not calculated, but it was just like, he did so much that wasn't, uh, you know, and and still does. That's not on the page, right? Yeah, and you Where, could feel it. You could yeah. see it. Like I wasn't sitting there going, "Oh, he planned that eye twitch," but it it just happened, and somehow you knew it was part of his methodology. Yeah. And it was just, it was so beautiful. That that was that's always been the real treat for me with working with some of these real actors, like you know, you know, James Caan. And, and Another and, one. Yeah, I mean, solid and just a gang and so good and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's it's amazing. So to answer your question, I I just I I just feel happy I get to work with any of these people. You yeah, know, it's been so cool. Yeah, you uh you can tell you've picked up some of the Dreyfus isms. I think people <laughs> yeah. actually say you're the Richard Dreyfus of comedy. Me? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I also. Uh, I also like to make mountains out of mashed potatoes and <laughs> shaving cream. And, Does he do that? Yeah, I remember in Close Encounters. Oh, yeah. He kept making little piles oh, that, yeah. that resembled that mountain where the spaceship was. What a fucking crazy movie. Yeah, I know. Close Encounters. Do you remember where you were when you saw that for the first time or Jurassic Park or E.T.? I feel like those are all in the same boat as like, whoa. Like we're getting a glimpse of... <laughs> I'll tell you real quick, Jurassic Park, first time I saw it in the theaters when it came out with my dad and his 90, at the time, two-year-old mom. First time you see the dinosaurs and Sam Neill does that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mom, right sitting behind. The the way the seats were, it was me and then my dad and his mom sat right behind me. Dinosaurs, you see the first shot. She just goes, fake. Oh, no way. (laughs) Your mom? 92. My dad's mom. My grandma. She yells fake. Fake. (laughs) I'd say 30% of the crowd laughs. laughs) Because, come on, man. The the hype behind this movie is huge. And so we're all wanting, the same way you said wanting that to be Christian Slater instead of Orny Adams, we're all wanting to believe, like, whoa, (laughs) these these dinosaurs are real. Like, we're now getting to see it. Fake. (laughs) Dude. It gets a laugh. Then she doubles down. She goes, not real dinosaurs. (laughs) What? I turn around. I go, I go. Grandma, you just, you gotta be, you gotta show like everyone really wants this to be real. Yeah. Like you gotta, we, we it's and obvious. could they look any realer? It's like this brand new technology. Yeah, that... yeah. This wasn't, you know, like, uh, you know, if you go to a museum, you know, and they've got those animatronic, like, or you're, no. if you're at Disneyland and you're at Pirates of the Caribbean and there's one of those guys, you know, going like, in a, you know, yeah, yeah, scream fake. I get it. It's gonna sound like a real name dropper thing, but I Please. just I just spent the after the morning on the phone with the guy who created the T Rex for Jurassic Park. But Shut. That, that's for another day. No, that's for right now. No, that's for right now. And then we'll go into the movie that blew your mind the first time you okay, saw it. Okay. Okay. What, what? How were you on the phone with him? So you know, I went to animation school, right? Yes. And my roommate Steve Williams. Uh, who obviously has the last name we we were roommates in college and uh steve had the foresight to recognize that uh, animation was going to be computerized eventually this is this is in the early 80s before any computer animation had hit but he he knew it was coming. He How? Had, he just he, he's a smart guy mm. and just knew something else was going to have to. Yeah, I mean, we knew we had heard it was coming, yeah. but but there was nothing there yet. And so on the weekends, he would go into a community college and start kind of working on this stuff. And and he would come back on Sunday night back to our condo that you know me and two other guys shared with him. And he go, guys, you got to see this. You got to see this. And we're like, what? What? He goes, oh my god, you should have seen what I did. And and he'd put in a VHS tape for us. And for those of you who don't know what a VHS tape is, it's a VHS tape. Fuck <laughs> off. Um, and he'd put in a VHS tape, and there'd be like five circles on it, like yeah. a green one, a yellow one, a red one, a blue one. And we'd be like, okay. And then they'd start strobing. Like one would go off, another one would come on, and we we go. 
We go, he'd be so excited. And we go, yeah. And he goes, well, this is digital. And I go, what do you mean? And they go, it was, it was done like through a computer. These are digital. And we go, so your circles that are going on and off are digital. Yeah, great. Yeah. You know, and so we kind of goofed with them and made fun of them a bit. And and then when he got out of college, he worked at this place called um, Oise or Alias or something like that. Opus Anus? Yeah, Opus and Anus' is, uh, <laughs> digital <kidding>. animation factory. <laughs> and I remember going in to see him at work. He goes, Har, you got to see this. You got to see this. And and he showed me like kind of like some undulating, like rippling water. And I went, okay. And I, I wasn't impressed. And yeah. then the next time I went in, he had like a like a slug, like a like a garden slug, kind of moving along. And I go, yes. He goes, well, it's digital. It's not real. And I go, yeah, it looks digital. Yeah. And then the third time I went in, he had a hummingbird flying around. And I go, oh, this is really great footage. How'd you film this? And he goes, it's digital. And I went, you got to be kidding. Like it, this hummingbird looked so real. And I went, you got me. And then next thing you know, he gets hired by ILM. And they're in the middle of production for Jurassic Park, and, and they're they're doing the dinosaurs, the old Harryhausen way. Remember the old Sinbad movies where everything was like yes. the Plasticine monsters? Yeah. So they'd already designed these monsters. They'd even started shooting. And Steve, uh, on his own time, built the skeleton of the T-Rex and, and put it together, and they told him not to. They said, it's not going to work. Don't do it. And so one day when the whole gang was in his office, the producers and everyone, they came to uh, to check in on some stuff. Steve thought, you know what, I'll put my my walking digital skeleton of the T-Rex up on a monitor and just play it on a loop. And so during the meeting, some of the big execs saw it and go, what the hell is that? And he showed them. They took it to Spielberg, and it changed movie history. Oh, my He, he God. built the whole T-Rex. and Unbelievable. So oh. from those stupid little circles... To, so anyways, I was on the phone with him this morning. He just bought a new house, and he was taking me on a virtual tour, and then he got attacked by velociraptors <laughs> and died. But, he was, <laughs> it was pretty, but anyways, it's, it's, if, if you watch, you know the, the, that series on Netflix, the movies that made us? Yes. The new one with Jurassic Park, that's, uh, you'll see Steve He's in featured it. in it? He's featured all the way through it. Yeah, awesome. it's a pretty fascinating story. Man, those are the things you never fucking think about. Who's the? Because that movie, is, I mean, it's... You know, nothing without that, without the... I mean, it would have looked cool. It, w it still would have had that kind of jerky, like, you would have known it was, like, kind of plaster scene. Like, yeah, it would have looked like, I don't know if, if you remember in RoboCop when that, that kind of robotic thing came yeah. out with all the machine guns. Yeah, yeah. It looked great, but in the back of your head, you're like, okay, it's somebody's... It's stop motion. And what Steve did is he... he Got eliminated stop motion and made fluid motion wow. and you know you could you could texturize and you could make the eyes glow and i mean it's just you you saw it you know it's crazy so yeah that's uh pretty wild that's a cool that's a cool friend to have yeah i yeah. feel like the stories that you get from that guy at like a barbecue how do you introduce that by the way if you're steve just yeah. at like a friend's you know baby shower and like what do you do yeah how do you fucking... I know, it's weird. I, go, uh, I created the T-Rex. Yeah, yeah, and they go, fuck off. And yeah. Go, All right, I'm going to leave. Yeah. This isn't the party for me. I know, it's it's interesting. It, 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 you know, it's something that literally changed the face of, of film. You know, it, it uh, it's quite amazing. Um, You're changing the face of literature. <laughs> oh, really? I am. With your new book of short stories. Yes. Uh, Don't Look Under the Bed. Yeah. Har, I was telling you before we sat down, man, it's like you fucking do it all. And obviously in your stand up and, and your movies and uh, and your sketches and the shows uh, that you create, both animated and not, um, you know, I just knew you were a writer. But like this is a different skill set and a different like part of your um, what's the word I'm looking for, Bri? Part of your, uh, I don't know, uh, arsenal of just like repertoire. Repertoire, thank you. <laughs> Where, uh, you know, your last book, which was, uh, sorry, help me out again. The things the, you don't know, you don't know. It's a humor book, which yeah. people should also go, uh, uh, also, also go out and get. 
Um, I like to do Michael Caine when I'm pitching my friends. Yeah, I should do it lovely. Oh, no, that wasn't him. Who is that? I don't know. I think that was leukemia. <laughs> Kane? Leukemia Kane, yeah. Uh, was that was your, your SNL audition? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Um, so the, I was expecting it to be another humor book, which I was pumped for. Okay. There's yeah, no like, yeah. be, like, no, like, ah, oh, geez, another funny book from Harlan. It was like, oh, great. I what, don't look under the bed. I wonder what this is. Or even, and it's in short stories. I thought it was maybe like goof, uh, fake, fake ghost stories or something. Right, right, right. You yeah. know? And then I started reading and I'm like, okay, this is like really, I mean, again, I just jaw open how oh. detailed, how the, the worlds you create, how, um, just for lack of a better word, creative uh, it, it was, and and building these um, truly short stories out of nothing, and how invested I was I, immediately. Oh wow, that's, that's cool. Amazing. And also, I'll say this: I haven't read an actual book, and I can't remember when. I'm just oh, not, wow. I've never been a reader. It was yeah. always like a forced thing on me. I've yep. always been more of an even when audio books became a thing, I was like, thank fucking god, that's how <laughs> yeah, I yeah, yeah. can absorb more. And I. Yeah. It's also, I think maybe a little ADD of always having to reread things, and and I read books, and there's been a handful of like bio uh, books I've read that um, that I've enjoyed, but it's it takes me a while. Yeah, but dude, yeah. I was locked in. Wow, I don't know. Wow, thank I, truly, you. I just was like I couldn't stop. Maybe also knowing that it was like um, attainable as far as like the amount that I was going to have to absorb. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I knew yeah. I wasn't reading like a, a novel. I was. Yeah, uh, sure. that's why I kind of did short stories. I didn't. I didn't want to put the the onus of having to invest in a whole novel, which can be great. Yes. But a lot of people, especially nowadays in the Instagram world, just don't seem to want to commit. So I figured a collection of short stories. Is it okay if I hold the book up? Please. There, yeah. There, right there. There's the cover. Don't Sweet. look under the bed. Did you design the cover? I did. That's actually my bed. And that mask is, I bought that when I was on a journey in Nepal years ago in the shadow of uh, of Mount Everest, to be honest. And so what I did is I propped that under my bed and put a candle behind it, and I shot that with my phone. This is the world we live in now. So we going to take it? I was just going to pull focus on it. Oh, yeah, will you? Yeah. yeah it's, it's Wait, so, so say that again? You, you pulled it under what? I put it under my bed, and then I just put a candle behind the mask. It's a it's a wooden mask. It's a beautiful mask, but it's kind of creepy. And I thought, oh, that would work great with... I thought of the title for the book before I uh, I thought of the cover concept. But cool. the, the book uh, kind of has the, the story you've read already, that the taxidermist is kind of a bit of a horror story. Yeah, man. And then the other ones are aren't so much horror, but they're very kind of bizarre and, yes. and strange. So, so uh, I thought that would work well. I have a billion questions. Okay. A, it's a must get. I, I mean, we got it on the Kindle in a heartbeat. But you can get the hard copy out in stores, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. It's on Amazon, and yeah. then you can order from it, and you they will send you the hard copy, or you can get the digital on Kindle, and uh, it's really cool. They just send it right on out to you. So. I like that you say this. I was, I was, uh, after decades of wondering if I was even a good writer or not, I decided I'd just finally put the stories out there and let you, the reader, decide. I write for my own enjoyment, and if what I write brings something to you, then that makes me happy as well. My stories may surprise you as they delve into some of the darker, more serious themes of life, a thousand percent, which is also another thing that sucked me in. It was just like, oh man, this is like a world and scenario that I have no connection to, but yeah. I feel connected to it. Cool, cool. Um, my stories run the gamut from fiction to horror, romance to sci-fi, absurd to er absurd to erotic. I love to write in as many varied genres as my imagination will take me. Your imagination is. I've had countless people ask me this, just knowing that um, that I'm buds with you. They're like, they're like, what is it like to be around Harland for a fucking day, for a racquetball thing, for a movie, for a bukkake party? Like, what's what is this guy like? I love Greek food. <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? I'm sure you get like have gotten that for a while where people just go, what's it like to be in his brain? Or like, what's and even this, it's just like as I'm reading, I'm like, I don't know how where you're going to that's inspiring these these stories, for lack of a better word. Well, you know, I think there's two Harlands. There's Harland where I can just be me and, and be out with friends and, you know, function at a pretty normal level. Yeah. But it's almost like it's almost like I have this other room in my head that nobody gets into but me and and that's that's where my comedy comes from that's where my books come from that's where my ideas come from it's not like i walk around 
you know, we hang, we'll hang out at the mall and go to a movie and I don't do anything that spectacular. We yeah. have some laughs. We yeah. buy a donut. We yeah. throw lawn darts at old ladies. <laughs> I don't sit there and go, Hey, little, you know what I mean? Like I kind of reserve all that special stuff and keep it, you know, stored away. And that's why I, I think I do things like stand up and write books and create shows and because I, I, I want that stuff to come out, but yeah. I don't think it's appropriate just to dump it on someone. Now, that being said, I'm, I'm not opposed to throwing around some fun and silly and yeah. unique ideas oh, when yeah. we're hanging out. I'm oh, not yeah. like Boardsville, but I'm, I, I definitely don't expose everything that's in my head. And I think we're all like that, yeah. you know, especially creative people, you yeah. know, and you... I find sometimes too that the best stuff is is you know sometimes when you let stuff out prematurely, it can sort of ruin the party. It's almost like a surprise party, but you do it too soon, and and you go, eh, I already told someone the idea. I I don't really feel like writing it anymore. Whoa. So, or even with jokes and stuff, like I I kind of keep the creative stuff under a rock. And I like to get it out and and then let people see it. So you've never been someone to maybe be hanging out and be like, hey, do you think this is funny? Or no. subtly work a bit on a pal? or No. I do it the opposite. The first time I did the David Letterman show, actually, I you know I, I went to New York. I flew in, and it was my, my first time. And I was like, I, was like, I don't want to release it. I don't want to let it out till the minute I'm on that stage at the Ed Sullivan Theater. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, when you go to do the Letterman show, when you had to do the Letterman show, it's not there anymore. They would make you come in like two nights early and the producers would take you around New York to every comedy club there was. Run your set. And run your set. And for those that don't know what that means, you have to do the exact set you're doing on Letterman for them in front of a, a stand-up crowd and and i i just went i'm not going to release the magic i'm not i'm not going to open that door so i went up and i i verbally said the joke but i didn't put anything on it mm. so picture a, an uncooked steak with no seasoning or anything you know what yes. i mean and and they told and then i i, I said i got to save the magic for the moment for that exact moment and then when i went and did letterman you know, according to everybody else and just my own meter, I, I knocked it over the wall. Awesome. And when I when I walk backstage, they go, Harlan, you killed it. He, he, they said, you have no idea we are this close to canceling you because I didn't show them what I had. I, I, I refused to let it out. Even and, though, again, to go back to our earlier, earlier point mm -hmm. about maybe like, you know, not making someone audition, even though you already know that they've yeah. got the goods. It's yeah. like they had seen you because they booked you. Yeah. They knew, like, they trusted their choice, and right. now, but they're like, but we need to see it again in, in our, under our terms, almost, like, yeah, to, yeah. around these clubs that, and yeah. then we'll, and then we'll give it the final okay? Yeah, that's right. Well, no, it wasn't the final okay. It, what happened is that when they auditioned me for the show, I was doing my material and my thing, but when you do that show, oh, they, right. they sit down and go, hey, let's do these jokes, these jokes, and here's the order, we'll do them, and so... They basically want to know what they're getting, gotcha. which kind of sucks. But in a way, it, it, it gets you really tight. And wow. um, like Mr. Opus and and <laughs> and so and so I was, um, I, you know, I ran the set that we'd agreed to and that they we all wanted to do. But I did. I just didn't do it with any um, pizzazz. You know, I just I just did it very flatly. And I said, I can't I can't give the David Letterman set until I'm on David Letterman. Right. I'm not going to I'm not going to put the the shine on it that it that I know I will. Now, uh real quick, is this the sign if you're signing pizzazz at like a is that the sign for pizzazz? This is the sign for pizzazz. Yes. And this is the sign for <laughs> priest touch. Have you ever been touched by a priest? Looks like jazz fingers. <laughs> no, that's the t priest touching. You will. You will. You'll be touched. <laughs> Wait, what was that like then going up and having to bomb then? Uh, it, uh, it was fine. It was you, fine. You just go, I'm not going to even give what this fully gets. So now I have to just right. stand up here and take the I silence. Perf I performed my Letterman set at, at you know, at a, at a five instead of at a ten. Okay. Or maybe even less sometimes. But I, I had that confidence. Cool. I just knew. I knew. Wow. And I knew that if I did it at a ten... When I went and did Letterman, all the all the shine would have rubbed off already, and yeah. I I didn't want to let it go. There's a magic to 
that moment you walk out and so that's true artistry man but i did i was naive i didn't i didn't know that you know i i was just doing it for me because they almost canceled you and i didn't know that like they told me when i got they go harlan we were two seconds from canceling you 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 were sucking and and i knew i was but they never said anything they said they never said hey you gotta you gotta show us something here like i think they were nervous to step on my vibe but i was naive to the point where i didn't i was just doing what i had to do to shine you know so looking back it's kind of funny that's uh that's so i mean dude taking those chances and you know as long as i've known you i feel like you've been that way which is like i even if it's not the popular move like you know with you know who you are you're like i'm gonna do i'm gonna take these chances i'm gonna bet on myself i'm gonna take these chances creatively comedically I mean, yeah. you know, force of nature. Uh, you're special out in in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, you know, caramel corn, the pug special. After doing countless specials of just Harland, yeah. it's like you do things where you go, "I'm gonna try." I'm. I think this is gonna be funny. Yeah. And we'll see. And yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. but I'm gonna go full balls to the wall with it, and and just keep creating. Yeah. And it's like even if this doesn't, if this moves the needle a little bit, if it moves it a lot, it's gonna like it's moving it for me because yeah, it's right. fueling my creative desires and my right. and and flexing that muscle in a way that that i um yeah i don't know i've always d- uh, dug that and that's like an you you can't teach that that's you have to just have that man yeah yeah you just I gotta i you, think everyone has their own artistic pathway and drive and mine mine's maybe a little weirder than most but i don't know i'm i'm not trying to be out there i'm just trying to follow what my voice tells me to do you know uh the book is uh i can't recommend it enough you give uh, oh, again you. uh well i can i guess i could i guess i could recommend it enough right yeah to where you're like all right yeah easy easy <laughs> dial it back nacho <laughs> Uh, don't look under your bed. Available everywhere. You dedicated it to your mom, Lorraine, your sister, Megan, and your friend, Sherry. Yeah. Where do, um, I mean, I know your mom insists in their uh, importance in your life. Can you break it down for me why you yeah. gave those three a shout out? Well, my mom, uh, God rest her soul, she's dead now, but she was a writer. And the first story in the book, The Taxidermist, I actually wrote that when I was 19 in college shut the fuck so up. that's how long these stories have been not out there in the world it, i've been sitting on these stories so i wrote that when i was 19 years old in college did you show it to her and i showed it to her and my mother for years she she kept kind of nudging me she goes harlan this is good that you should get this out there you should and here i am uh I'm going to be 59 in two weeks, and I, I'm finally putting it out there. That's how long it's been sitting on the shelf. Wow. And so I, I wrote in the dedication to my mom, thank you for, you know, you know, encouraging me and believing in it. And it always, it always sat in the back of my head, you know. My mom never really did that with much else in my life, but for some reason that, that story. And what's, what's interesting is my mom was... My mom was a real kind of conservative, straight shooter woman, you know, like, and this, this story is sort of dark. It's like a horror story. Yeah. It's pretty kind of freaky and scary. And, and the fact that she kind of got behind it always, always made me go, yeah, it's so interesting. But she, so anyways, her, the residue of her saying that stuff helped me kind of always think maybe someday I'll put them out. It's awesome. And so I did that for her. And then the second part of it is I lack the confidence in my writing. And this is another reason they've sat so long. And I asked my sister, Megan, I said, look, it, I wrote all these stories, but, I, you know, there's little things like maybe some of the grammar and, and this and that might not be perfect. Would you proofread them for me? And so she agreed to do that about a year ago. And so that was the second phase of getting him out there. And then the last phase, my friend Sherry, I wasn't really sure how to manipulate the whole getting them published on Amazon and the formatting. And she really jumped in and helped me do that. And so these three people kind of helped me finally get these books out since I was 19 years old. So (laughs) that's what kind of a writer was your mom? Uh, My mom was uh, she was a travel writer to begin with. Mm. And then she 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 got her first book out um, just before she died, and it's a beautiful book. I think it's called 
my life at the beaches or something lorraine williams and she wrote a, a book about her life as a child growing up on the shores of lake ontario in toronto uh during the depression when she was a little girl and uh it's interesting because i wasn't close to my mom but when she when i read her book i felt closer to her than i ever had my whole life wow pretty amazing yeah so. yeah that's huge when you get that from any family member especially a parent especially your mom that yeah. gives you any sort of like oh this is like whatever you even at 19 like that which is a very i, I mean i don't know what what age you consider more uh, a, a larger level of importance as far as like the way you're shaping your comedic sensibility right but at 19 i feel like it's still developing oh so yeah it's like for her to be like and for anything you're doing creatively to be like oh yeah keep like that was that wasn't bad like that was yeah. keep like and i'm i'm digging that and this is what she does that uh that you know that carries uh, a lot of value yeah and she she kind of kept circling back to it over the years like she wouldn't say anything and then like you know six years would go by she goes harlan have you ever done anything with that story about the taxidermist so she Whoa. kept kind of like bringing it up as as time went by and and so uh, it was so good, man. There's there's a <laughs> I don't know if there's if this is a way th things get made. But I mean, obviously, the way that short films can turn into features, how couldn't a short story turn into a uh, a longer uh, bit? Because I definitely saw like, oh, wow, so much from that uh, that opening <laughs> one, you. man. Yeah. Well, well, you know, it's interesting because many of Stephen King's films come from short stories he wrote, like well, Apt Pupil and Lawnmower Man and. Uh, a lot of his short stories, Children of the Corn, a lot of those stories come from his short stories. And just by default, I think it's because I'm, I'm in movies. I'm also a filmmaker on the side. And I think in, in sort of the through the prism of a director, a lot of my stories, I, I look at them when I'm done. I don't plan them this way, but I look at them when I'm done and I go, wow, each one of these could be a movie. And it's, it's interesting. So it's cool. I okay. hope one day they are, Fuck you know. Yeah. So, um, well, I'm sure it will. And, and it'll be another film to add to the long list of Harlan Williams classics. <laughs> I want to play a little game with you before we wrap up. Oh, I love a, games. A couple games, actually. Oh, good. Um, it's, uh, it's one where I'm going to throw you some quotes from some Harlan Williams classic films. And you got to tell me what movie it's from. Um, we'll add in some music here. Oh, yummy. Is it romantic music? or? It's going to be the soundtrack to Bleached Opus. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. The old panda eye. <laughs> right. <laughs> you sound like my old boss at Albertsons. You see the old panda eye and that one with the huge can bajumbas? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this first one. <clears throat> I'm 30 years old. I'm almost a grown man. What's that from? Can I do it the way it's done in the... Please! I'm 30 years old. I'm almost a grown man. <laughs> That's from Rocket Man. Boom. Circle gets a square. How about this one? Um, saying this to a horse. Hey, girl, you hungry? And an overweight woman walks by and goes, fuck you. And then you go, I'm sorry. I was talking to the horse. <laughs> Good old half-baked. Amazing. Yeah. Did you love playing that character? Uh, you know, it was interesting. I had to grow into it. I turned that movie down about 10 times. You told me this. Because I didn't want to do a drug movie. Yes. And be maybe pigeonholed as a stoner, right? Not that. I just, okay. I wasn't a drug guy and I didn't want to perpetrate the, 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 the drug culture. Okay. I was very sensitive to that. But then I went, you know what? I'm acting. I'm acting as a guy who who's a drug user. Gotcha. And they exist. So that's what acting is. So I, I finally talked myself into it. But the beautiful thing about that scene where I was feeding the horse is I grew up in Toronto and when when I was a kid in high school me and all my buddies would walk downtown and hang out at a pizza parlor well that scene they shot right in front of the pizza parlor that's in the movie shut the fuck up yeah, dude that that's the pizza parlor we hung and if and if you could have panned to the right oh yeah outside of the frame of the film my best friend from high school was sitting there on my director's chair watching me act that scene out. It was it was surreal. Awesome. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, that was... You were my favorite character in that movie, and I've told oh, you this. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I've told I you that many that. times. Oh, yeah, dude. Oh, wow, thank you. Just because it was like the fact that the whole story was, you know, truly based around what happened to you. Yeah. But also, like, there was just such a... Um, uh, you know, aside from being such a likable guy, there was a smartness to the like 
like aloofness that Kenny had. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, it, like even when it was like, "Hey, girl, you hungry?" And then she's like, "Fuck you!" You're like, hey, "I was talking like <laughs> you just weren't, you know, like you just didn't skip a beat, man." Yeah, I know. In retrospect, it was really fun. And and was and the premiere nuts? The premiere, I didn't even get to go to. Gotcha. Uh, I forget why. I think it. I think it. You know, I hate to say this, but. It was in New York, and mm. I was in L.A., and I think they wouldn't pay for a ticket out there for me. Yikes. And I just went, well, fuck you guys. Like, I'm one of the stars of the movie. That's bonkers. This is Paramount Pictures, and you, you're you not going to fly me out to my own movie? Like, So I was like, fuck you. I was pissed. What's fucked up is I remember they flew the horse out, though. Yeah, they threw the horse out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I did go to the premiere of Mr. Holland's Opus, and that hurt. That hurt a lot. I didn't walk straight for weeks. <laughs> we'll add a cha-ching noise. Thanks. Uh, check it, check, check it out, guy. He's the alpha male of the store. Chicks always go after the alpha male. They're like lions, kings of the desert. And you, you're just a little tiny field mouse dangling in the teeth of the lion while he's banging your chick. Oh wait a minute, box boy, you're like the little hairy nutsack on the little hairy field mouse swinging back and forth while he's banging your chick. Uh, that's employee of the month, I believe. Yeah. With Dane Cook yep. and Jessica Simpson. Yep. Man. Good times. Okay, last one. Hey, Commander, were you ever afraid of monsters under your bed? When I was little, I used to think there was a baker under my bed. <laughs> Don't look under the bed. That's Rocket Man as well. Amazing. Yeah. All yeah. right, last one. Yeah. Approaching the bottom, sir, I can hear a couple of lobsters duking it out. Oh, that's down Periscope. With Kelsey Grammer. That's right, yeah. Underrated movie. Yeah, that was my second movie. Yeah. Yeah, that was the movie that kind of blew everything up for me, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, because yeah, that cast was bonkers. It was crazy, but it was it was so fun because, like I was saying earlier, with the bus movie, a lot of times with a movie you shoot a scene with another actor and then you don't see him for six days, yeah. and then you shoot another. But when you're in a bus or a submarine, everyone's always in the background. So we all, the whole cast, had to be there every day for like months mm. together, and it was just it's such a bonding experience because you're just together for fourteen hours a day, like joking and laughing oh, and it yeah. was great it's kelsey yeah. Grammer a goof you know he this is interesting at the time we shot that movie i think it was his first like big like studio movie oh, they shit. were kind of like oh he did fraser he did this this is going to be his breakout yeah. movie but and i'm not being gossipy this is just fact but at the time he was uh i believe he was being charged with statutory rape Yikes. he was in rehab for alcohol and who knows what else and he had just flipped his Dodge Viper up on, I think, Mulholland. So it was it was really so in other words, he, he was very standoffish the whole time. He was yeah. fun on set, really nice guy. Cool. But but as soon as they yelled cut, he kind of sort of disappeared. Yeah. And and I th I think it's just because obviously the guy was going through a lot and, and I'm no sour grapes, but it, it just he, it was so I we really didn't get to know him that well yeah. because of that, you know. But more, but your experience mostly with uh, with people on set, like when you're, uh, you know, with somebody that's, you know, especially leading the charge on the film, pretty like everyone's hanging, good vibe, right? Oh, like yeah. kind of. Yeah, I think the only the only director that really rubbed me the wrong way was was the director um, from the whole Nine Yards, Jonathan. He he was a he was an older British guy. And most directors just let me improv and run with it, yeah. and they can keep it or leave it or whatever. And he, I think he was the only director that when I started kind of doing my thing, he kind of like, uh, Holland, let's not do that. Let, 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 let's not do that. Like he was oh. kind of like, and I, I, I thought, well, where did that come from? And then I'll never forget the, the audition process. <laughs> yeah. I went into, I went in to do the audition for the whole nine yards and, I sat down and there he was and he sat across from me. He was like, he was all excited and he, you know, no directors really ever asked me this, but the first thing out of me, he goes, Holland, welcome. So did you read the script? And I just looked at him and I said, well, I'll be honest with you, sir. No, I didn't. And his face just fucking dropped. Like it was like, it was like a dad told his kid it was zoo day and then said, we can't go. And he's just like, and, 
and then I read, and somehow I must have knocked it over the wall, and I got the part. But I, I, I think it might have always pissed him off, like just the look in his face that. Not only I did didn't... you not read the script, you wanted to improvise words based off of words you didn't even <laughs> fucking well, know. Well, the improvising was on set. Yeah, I, I of didn't. Course. I, I yeah. probably did improvise in the audition a bit because that's something I always do. At that point, but... too, I feel like you were pretty established as somebody that's. Yeah. bringing that to the table. Yeah, and that that's why it was a little bit frustrating because he he wouldn't let me go there and and I thought, dude, trust me, like I'm I'm bringing stuff that usually my stuff makes it into the final cut. But, well, and but it's funny okay. it's funny you say that because I have a scene, my favorite scene in movie history and from my favorite movie of all time. Ooh. And it's uh just happens to be with you. And so uh, we've oh. talked about it but I'd like to do it with you if you don't oh, mind. I'm yeah. going to hand it to you. Oh, yeah. Think, Let me get the peepers out. It's from... Uh, oh, my God. Is it's this, from is Opus it... Anus 2, <laughs> Even Anus, sir. Is this Mr. Holland's <laughs> Opus? I'll die if it is. Oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah? yeah? Can we? Oh, of course, okay, buddy, great. for you. Okay. Uh, I love you, dude. <clears throat> I'll play both Harry and Lloyd. So you want me to start from the very top? Yeah. Okay, ready? Yeah, here yeah. we go. Here we go. Pull over! No, it's a cardigan, but thanks for noticing. <laughs> Pull over. What? Pull over. No, oh shit. No, it's a cardigan, but thanks for noticing. I oh, did it again. Yeah, killer boots, man. Pull your vehicle to the side of the road. And then I get out. Oh, I walk up to yeah. them. License and registration, please. You, uh, you fellas were going a little fast back there, wouldn't you say? Uh. You fellas been doing a little bit of boozing, have you, huh? Sucking back on uh, Grandpa's old cough medicine? Uh, no, 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 sir, no. Yeah? Well, what's that? That's nothing, sir. Yeah, nothing. Yeah? Well, are you aware that it's against the law to have an open alcohol container here in the state of Pennsylvania, huh? Come on, give me that booze, you little pumpkin, pear, pumpkin pie pumpkin cutted free. Come on! <laughs> okay, let me hand you the drink. Take that Coke there. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll yeah. use the coke. Yeah. Sir, sir, no, sir, sir, no, no, wait, sir, don't. You'd keep your mouth shut if you know what's good for you, buddy. <laughs> Tic Tac, sir? <laughs> Get the hell out of here. <laughs> I did the little noise out of time, out of place. Oh my fucking god! That's the same noise as your. You do that dolphin joke. Where, uh, yeah, and I think that's same. where you told me. That's where you got it from. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, where it that came joke. from. Yeah, I did. Uh, that's how that got into the movie. Yeah, I what, the Farrelly brothers came to see me do stand up. Right. And at the time, I was doing a joke about Whitney Houston when she was, <laughs> she had that hit "I Will Always Love You," yeah. and her voice just gets higher and yes. higher and higher. And I said, eventually, it just like went into a dolphin noise. Like, <laughs> I will always love you. <laughs> you know, whale noises and everything. <laughs> and then when we were shooting Dumb and Dumber, we we sh we did about five takes, and then you know, Peter and Bobby come up, they go, do, do that, do that whale noise, that that dolphin sound. And I go, what? And they go, do it. And I go, where? They go, I don't know. Just just find a place for it. And so I thought, well, what does piss taste like? You know? So I did the, I did the dolphin noise. Fucking iconic. Yeah. I've told you this before. We, I mean, we quoted that shit at school for just months after. Oh, and and wow. everyone tried to, it. It was so funny about it, too. It's like nobody could do, nobody could do that noise. Yeah. Which made it even cooler. Because you're just like, people would go, try to reenact the scene and then go, and they go, yeah, you, you know what it sounds like, though. You know, and they just couldn't do it. And they go, Wait, we should just pull the clip up, you know. Well, here's a little trivia, movie trivia. When I did something about Mary, if you watch, I do the dolphin noise in that movie, too. But they, they turn the volume off of it. So there's a scene where, where we're talking, and I go, yeah, Sierra, this thing said seven minute abs, and Ben still goes, no, well, what if it's six? And then I go, I go, no, nobody's doing six. And then I go, <laughs> So if you watch the movie, you'll see my fate. You'll see me physically do it. Yes. And the Farrelly's, they turned the volume off of it for some reason. I guess they didn't want the carryover from. But uh. I, I saw it when I went to do ADR, and I thought, oh, I wish they had left that in. Yeah. Because it, it, actually, it actually worked in that movie, too. So if you're at home and you're watching something about Mary and you want to add your own <laughs> in, then it, that'll be a lot of fun. It's a fun game for the kids. Yeah. 
All right, we're going to close this out. Thank you for doing that. That was – Oh, my Come pleasure. on, man. What a come treat. Well, All right, we're going to close this out with a James Lipton Inside the Actor Studio 10-question questionnaire. Okay. Um, and I'm going to play Lipton. Oh, wow, the soup guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Harlan Williams here. Harlan, what is your favorite word? Um, my favorite word is conundrum. Love yeah. that word. Yeah. As soon as I discovered what that word was, I, it's one of those words I actively try to use a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, to describe any sort of like predicament yeah. or uh, tough call. Yeah, it's a conundrum. Be a great name for a uh, child. Yeah. Conundrum, dinner's ready. <laughs> fuck off. Conundrum. <laughs> I said fuck off. Conundrum. Are you on the roof again? Fuck off. <laughs> And then this is conundrum <laughs> falling off the roof. Yeah. Fuck off. <laughs> they live in an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> On the top floor. Harlan, what is your least favorite word? <sighs> conundrum. <laughs> what turns you on? Oh, I would have to say turns me on mm -hmm. is... The ocean. Yeah, dude, you love it. Yeah. The energy, the smell of sea cucumber in the morning, the uh, sea turtle placenta, <laughs> sea urchin clit, the smell of that in the morning. What does it smell like? Like a clit that's been slammed in a car door four or five times and swollen up like a loaf of sun, sun made raisin bread. Yeah. Let me just check here. Yes, that's correct. correct. Google ding, has ding. the exact yeah, definition yeah. down. Bingo. Um, what turns you off? Um, angry people, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Pushy, angry people. Yeah. No time for that. Yeah. We've all got our shit, but hey, man. Yeah. Pe people that, that assume they're right and try to push their right onto you and try yes. to make you wrong. Yes. That I don't like. Yes. What turns you off? Wait, that's what I just asked. Fuck me. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck me. Wow, you nailed it. What, <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? What is it? What sound or noise do you love? What sound or noise? Yeah. What's a sound or noise? What oh, sound what sound or, or noise? noise? I'm sorry, I can't really articulate <laughs> yeah. well from beyond the yeah. grave. Yeah, yeah. What sound or noise do I love? I love the sound of sizzling Coca-Cola on ice. Just that. Great answer. Yeah. When you pour it over and it just kind of oh, like the sizzling fresh and, cold ice, too. Oh, yeah. just The so, sound it makes. What is that, a cackle or a sizzle? A little bit of both, right? I, I think it's just heaven. But it, especially when you've just, like, done sports or you're just, you're just exhausted and hot. Trying and to then get you, quenched. You, you hear it before you put it in your mouth. It's just beautiful. We're still talking about the Coke, right? Are we talking about the car door clit? Ooh, ooh. I think they both fit into that exact <laughs> same category. Yeah. Good answer. Fair. They both sizzle. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? Uh, I hate, it's going to sound mean, but I hate, like, Babies crying on a plane. Oh, that's fine. That's not mean. I thought you were going to say, like, I hate Jewish guys negotiating. I was going to be like, that's mean. No, they don't know how to negotiate. <laughs> but when you're trapped on a plane with babies, and it's no fault of the baby, but no. I'm just saying it. I hate it because you know you can't shut it off. No. And it and, and if you're in close proximity to it, it's torture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even with headphones. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it's just, and you can't be mad at anyone. You can't get away from it, you but it, that's why it sucks. Cause you got to sit there. Okay. A new life on this planet. What a, <laughs> what a marvel. What a little angel. Someone get me a sledgehammer. <laughs> you just want that guy. Remember in the original Texas chainsaw, when oh, yeah. leather face yeah. pulled open that steel yeah. door and just walked out one crying. <laughs> You wish that you guy was in that. the back bathroom, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just walked out. And... Like, I did not know that guy was in 23B, but thank God. <laughs> yeah, leather face. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, there is. Do you ever do the turnaround? Just like a, you know, let them. You know? gotta, you gotta give them the glare. Yeah, you gotta just, just give them the glare. Yeah, you know, it's 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 like because some of them don't give a shit. They're like, "What do you want me to do?" And you're like, "Well, at least try to." That's the worst part when yeah. you have people that are just naive to the fact that there's 200 other people around, and they're just like, "Fuck you, we don't care." Like it, even pretend like take some acting classes at Devry and. <laughs> You know, pretend to fucking placate everyone. Yeah. Oh, she's she got never, rickets. Yeah. yeah, she's got leukemia, baby. Only has two days. Yeah. Let her cry. Let it might be her last one. Okay. You know. She's got diarrhea of the opus. Can you just oh, cut her some slack? Oh, yeah. Opus. Free Willy. <laughs> you just posted some video on the gram where you hashtag Free Willy, and you were in front of some. Was it a whale watching tour? Where were you? What the fuck was that? Oh, was it the one where I got shot? Did you shot? see Free Will? Was it the one where I got shot in front of the, where I was doing the wolf calls? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, my, my hashtags are totally random. Okay. They, they don't really mean anything. Gotcha. I just put up whatever pops into my head. And for some reason, I think because I was near water. Yeah. So I just put Free Willy. I did, because then I was, I was hopefully, as it started, and I noticed the hashtag, I was like, please, dear God, tell me. An orca whale flies over Harlan's head, and he, oh, I wish. And he just did. Oh, that yeah. would be so good <laughs> just to see a orca Volvo right over your face. It's Christmas in January. God. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt, Harlan? You know, I always, I've attempted uh, singing. Like, if I could come back and do it all again, I think I'd try and be like a singer-songwriter. Fuck yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I'm not saying I'm good at it, but I would attempt it. I, I, I feel like that's something that lives within me that I've explored to a degree in this yeah. lifetime. But I love the process of constructing a song, and I love music so much that if I came back and knowing now that, you know, we only have one, one track. Yep. And, I've done everything I've wanted to do in life, even that to a degree. But I think I'd jump in full throttle if I could come back. And what instrument? I would just sing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I might try to learn guitar or something, sure. but I just I just like singing and and working with the musicians yeah. and, and constructing a song and putting the layers on it. You crush those goddamn comedy jams. Oh yeah, that's, those are fun. Yeah, yeah. that's a close, uh, you know, yeah, a close experience to like getting a little feel of being a. Uh, well, I, I have stuff. a hobby band with my cousin, and and we uh, that's right. We 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 put together like serious songs. And Isn't there an album out? Yeah, it's did? called Rattlesnake Love. That's on, right. Uh, on Apple, yeah. you can track it down, and we you can you can go in and listen to about eleven of our songs. Amazing. And you'll see how much fun I have doing it. It's just it's a blast. And and again, they're not comedy. They're they're actually like most of them are love songs. Yeah. And so it, I just I just love tapping into that. I love that. What profession would you not like to do? Oh God, I would. You wouldn't say, want to be God. No, I'd be God. I would say Siamese twin gynecologist because <laughs> I can only handle one at a time. Yeah, yeah. Two, two is overload. Yeah, and me. which one do you start with? Yeah, that's the thing. You know. <laughs> you know, you want to be fair. Yeah, it's just you can't pick favorites. And I only have two hands. I can't. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> If, uh, if okay, last one. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say at the pearly gates? Oh, welcome. Because <laughs> if he doesn't, I guess I'm going the other way. So he's just on the side. All you want to hear is welcome. Yeah. Great yeah. answer. Yeah. We did it. We did it. Oh, thank you, guys. Buddy. The book again. Don't look under the bed. I'm gonna rack that focus again for me, Bray. Oh yeah. Don't look under the bed. Available. Uh, wherever you get your books yeah if you go to my website actually harlanwilliams.com there's a link right on the home page and you can it'll take you right to where you need to go to pick it up if you're so inclined and and by the way if you do um pick it up i'd love to hear your feedback because this yeah. is a, this is a new thing for me and, yes. and you saying what you said you're actually one of the, the books just out so you're one of the first people to give me any feedback awesome. on it i love that and i like honest feedback if it sucks i want to hear if you like it but but thank you and thank you for plugging it dude buddy. loved thank you. and it's just an i mean what an accomplishment to also just put out an, another book and to even you know like it's funny that you say like it's years later but like to even then have that awareness to then take what you started and go oh let's let's finish it up and like and yeah. then get do it all and i'm sure once you started to get into it too it got you excited to 
complete it, right? And then get excited about the cover. I can't stop. To be honest, I I was writing the last five pages of a new short story just before I drove down here. Like I'm I'm like hooked in. I I love it. Well, I love it, and I hope you do more. Thank Um, you. And uh, and you're one of the best. Harlan Williams on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks, buddy. And Um, And you're touring. I'm touring. Uh, I'm gonna be in Raleigh, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina this coming weekend. Oh, good. November fourteenth. Uh, okay. Is that is this gonna be on by then? It'll be after that. Okay. So I hope you had a good time seeing me. <laughs> and then uh, I guess me and you are going over to uh, Mr. Holland's uh, deli later for dinner. Oh, right? We are. Yeah. I hear the opus is delicious. <laughs> Green splats. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I can't. And please let me be in the fucking shit stain sketch. Oh, if there's uh, a part. Even if it's cutting to, you got, you know what yeah. you got to have? If it's an infomercial, you yeah. got to have the people that are like, oh, yeah, you're in. That talk you're about in. buying the product. Ernie Childs, yeah. Well, Come you're on. In, dude. You know what I'm you're, saying? You're in the shit stain one. <laughs> you just got the part. You hear that, mom? Yeah. <laughs> Dreams do come true. I love you, Har. Love you, buddy. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Great doggy. to see you, man. To Cheers. Mmm, Zoa. Thanks, Rock. Guys, Adam Ray here for the About Last Night podcast. Hope you enjoyed that episode. It was a good one. A lot of laughs, a lot of tears, a lot of uh, stuff to uh, to think about and chew on, huh? Because that's what life's all about, chewing on the good stuff. Nobody said that. Maybe Denzel did. Maybe Tom Hanks did. Maybe they said it together in Philadelphia. The point is, click subscribe right here on the ALN logo so you can get more episodes And stay up to date when new content drops, highlights, animations, clips. It's all here for you, baby. I'll see you next time. I don't know how to blink.